So today is Wednesday, August 14th, and we are bringing you Block Digest 187 at block height 590,107. So what is up today, Rick? Oh, another beautiful day in the mumble, man. I mean, like, I'm starting to like this new format. We're starting to peel it together to where it looks like, uh, you know, we can get the live chat and everything back together and... You know, I don't know. I just like doing new things and trying out new things, and this is pretty cool. So, yeah, this was going on this morning. Hopefully, next week we'll have more people here with us, and you guys can make it in. So, yeah, what's going on with you this morning, Janine? I'm good. All ready to go. Good to go. Yeah, I'm definitely good to go, too. Been going a little too much lately. How about you, Nopar? You been moving too much? Actually, I just realized how lazy person I am. <laughs> we are doing some company refactoring in Wasabi. Uh, part of it is to make Wasabi more resilient, but the other part of it is to get the administrative tasks uh, out of, of me. And well, how do you how do you reduce your administrative tasks? You you do a lot of administration to reduce your administrative tasks so i have to do all this kind of stuff talking to people buying this and that and i'm just so i I just so lazy i can code 12 hour a day but i cannot i cannot work eight hour a day for these kind of things it's it's hard it's hard and programming is the easiest one what's up monkey Well, um, I don't know. You know, I just kind of been thinking about uh, digest uh, over the last week, and you know, switching over to recording things this way and really opening this up and how this is going to work. And more importantly, um, for when we open up uh, the, the the chat room, I guess for recording next week, uh, making sure that everything is troll proof. And that, and that random idiots can't completely fuck up the episode recording. <laughs> you know that's not going to work. We're going to find some trolls in here, but that's nope. all right. No, nope. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, we troll on, on air. But, uh, you know, I think I, I think everything is set up or I can set things up in a way where nobody can fuck with anything and everybody can have their fun and, and listen to this live. And, and it'll be just like you two yeah, guys. Yeah. Uh, it'll be more fun than YouTube. Uh, you know, Shinobi is the king of the trolls. If someone succeeds in censorship, then it's going to be him. <laughs> yeah, he's got the iron fist in this room. But I, I like it. I like this. Everything seems to flow a lot better in the mumble already. And I like the ideas of some of the stuff we're talking about. And so, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, more people can join us in next week because, yeah, this is real interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the, the things I think I, I'm most excited about is, you you know, you, it happens a lot on, on air when we'll be covering a story and then we start talking about it. And then the next thing you know, we're like five tangents over having a conversation that really doesn't have a clear connection to the topic and, and, and try to rein that back in and keep it checked for time. But here we can just kind of let that go nuts and just cut that out for what we post on youtube so (laughs) we can have a little more fun and uh i guess uh i guess there can be uh some in jokes that only live viewers will get (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's definitely new format but i think it works 
All right, so all this interesting stuff going on with the format. What's interesting going on with the news? Because I know some news broke this this week and everybody was losing their minds. So what is happening then? Nothing. Um, absolutely um, nothing of note or, or interest. Um, nothing happening. of consequence? Nope, just a regular old uh, boring day with nothing to see here. You know, move along. Move along. All right, why don't you dig into it and tell us what's what we should be moving along from. Blockstream announced their Blockstream mining facilities, um, <clears throat> which they have two of operating right now, one in Quebec and the other in Georgia in the United States, uh, as well as a mining pool that for right now is only open to people actually hosting their their equipment at these blockstream facilities but which is going to be opening up to the public later on and which is sporting better hash support but really the i think the the most interesting thing about this isn't really just the announcement and us all learning about this but it's the fact that this has existed since 2017 so that this is like not some new thing uh starting right now like this is actually up and running and has been operation for multiple years uh just without any of us knowing about it and apparently the uh, whole start of it is samson mao so pretty much uh right when he got to blockstream he was trying to convince Adam back um, to start mining and that it was an extremely necessary thing for companies and big players in the space to do. And so, like, I think my personal favorite little fact in hindsight we get kind of peeling this back is um, our first special edition um, last year with Jonathan Bertrand. Um actually discussed and went into a, a lot of the issues with the electricity market, um, specifically dealing with Hydro-Quebec um, and the large influx of miners in the area. And, you know, Bitmain um, kind of swooping in there and attempting to buy out a lot of power. Well, this whole time, Blockstream was not only participating in, in this whole auction, attempting to get access to more electricity but actually already had facilities operational at the time and none of us knew this and i mean you know ultimately a lot of the the, the reasoning for this this product even being created in the first place uh, let alone just announced i think really comes down to just the overall dynamics of the, the entire mining ecosystem. I mean, anybody who watches us regularly knows I have gone at length into just vertical integration and how that is going to be the dominant trend in the mining ecosystem. And we're likely going to see retail producers disappear, people who are mining producing their own chips and just kind of this everybody doing everything from start to finish themselves. Well, Part of the reason for that is just efficiency of scale. And what Blockstream is trying to do here is kind of leverage that efficiency of scale to try to apply it in maintaining the decentralization that it's kind of helping to undo. If, it, if you can actually kind of pull some sense out of that, I know that sounds like a nonsensical statement, but you know, when you're mining at, at your house, you're not going to get anywhere close to the electricity prices that you can at a big co-location facility like this that's getting bulk prices. Like, th there's no way that you can get a hold of uh, equipment at the, at the scale that a big farm operator is. But, like, a facility like this being open offers the potential of, you know, having way less machines and having access to that bulk price because you can host your equipment here like not being able to afford um you know enough equipment to get a cheap discount on well now groups of people can pool in together for that and have their equipment hosted here and really at the the like end of the road here integrating better hash uh, unless this equipment gets like seized by a government i mean i don't see any situation where blockstream is going to walk in and rehook up machines 
to remove your control from them. And better hash allows you to point to your own node and do your own transaction selection for the blocks you're mining. So it's 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 like this this whole service or product or whatever you want to call it. it it's kind of taking all of the efficiencies of of uh, of scale that are kind of pushing mining towards more centralization and more do everything yourself instead of anybody can just jump in and do it and applying it to stop those effects from happening. And I think, you know, Samson's, you know, arguments and logic for it are, are really spot on when you, you kind of dig through and get to the heart of it instead of just getting lost in, in how counterintuitive it sounds. But, you know, ultimately the, the electricity available right now, um, between both of these facilities is enough to power between six to 10% of the entire Bitcoin network if it was hosted there. I mean, obviously we've just had a big difficulty increase lately and they're working on expanding to more facilities. So, I mean, ultimately like that this, this is here and this is going to keep growing. So this is going to be a part of the, the ecosystem now. And two of the clients that they're they're uh, kind of pointing at and, and, and I guess bragging about, so to say, is Fidelity, um, their their applied technology group, and the founder of LinkedIn. And really, like just all, all of this, like in terms of the centralization, I mean, just move that aside and look at the, the pure economics of the products. It's a, a data center with cheap electricity prices. And the most important part for a miner is specializing in mining equipment. They know how to install it. They know how to manage it. They know how to troubleshoot it. They understand the space. It's not taking a weird abnormal thing and shoving it in a data center and none of the employees know how to deal with it. So, <clears throat> you know, it, it's definitely something monetizable that's going to generate a revenue stream which is really the the second major thing blockstream ha has built to do that in the near term and it's like we really just have to see how this goes i mean obviously like there are a lot of reasons to be skeptical of this it's somebody who actually physically has control of mining hardware and that's always something people should think carefully about but you know, like I've said, every time this topic comes up, there's just a general direction that that whole aspect of the ecosystem is going. And, you know, this is part of it. So, you know, this is here for better or worse, and we're just going to have to see where it goes. But I'm kind of cautiously optimistic at how they're trying to build this out to maximize moving as much of that control into the, the actual equipment owner's hands as possible. I don't know, man. It sounds like they're trying to take over the Bitcoin world, huh? I'm just joking, uh, man. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, no. <laughs> I had somebody recently at my meetup where I've like, they're a really competent person, and then they just started going in one evening. Maybe they had too many drinks about how this uh, Bilderberg blockstream connection worries is worrisome. And I, I, yeah, to me, it's just like, come on, guys. These are these are specialists in this field, and they're trying to develop this technology in a direction that does push Bitcoin's decentralization and some of the features of Bitcoin that we want to make sure gets properly developed. And if that was all left into a few people's hands, that weren't these specialists, then I imagine that stuff would have a lot harder time getting developed. I mean, these guys are investing in satellites that are floating around that are beaming back lightning transmissions with messages tied to them. And, you know, all that development is required upon somebody mining these blocks and getting these transactions moving forward. So at a certain rate point, yeah, it just makes sense. And also, it's like, uh, sorry, <laughs> the stop is really troubling me here. But, uh, yeah, it just makes sense for them to be involved. The better hash. Okay. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. screwed now. Stop, got me. Alrighty then. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it's...
I mean, for, forget the conspiracy theories. I mean, you know, I, I've kind of gone into, I think, a, a lot of how I think this is going to affect the overall centralization of the ecosystem and just, like, that whole dynamic. But, you know, for a second, I, I, I want to kind of look at, like, Blockstream as a, as a company. You know, for a lot of their early history, it was, it was really, like, where's the money, the, the product, you know, all they were doing was just coding and designing things. And now, you know, years later, I think it's been like five, five years since it was founded, you know, Liquid is live now and it's kind of slowly picking up steam and being integrated and having all this infrastructure built out. And now that this mining or these mining facilities have been announced, and you know, I guess you can look at the the satellite feed. Although honestly, the the Lightning API, I think, is is not really any kind of real income, and it won't be for a long time. But you know, the, this mining facilities and Liquid, like they now have two things that, if adopted, are actual revenue streams and you know, profit generating products. And I mean that that's a, a huge bit of difference <laughs> from five years ago when everybody was kind of like well, what what are you you doing again and it's it's just it's it's kind of i, I you know i just i want to point out like just how different it is compared to almost every other big company in this space which it seems most of them have just like started off with that that product with that that thing and blew up and expanded and now they're just like faltering stagnating and like blockstream has done the exact opposite and if they really keep up like the, the pace of what they're doing or if there's <laughs> anything else like the these mining facilities that they haven't announced publicly yet like I, there is a lot more they're going to do before this company has any kind of real negative outlook long term i think all right rick we still having uh technical issues here no i'm with you now i had to like unmute one mic and then mute the other you know we're doing a little bit of testing with this new format and there was definitely something there that i need to be prepared for next go around so uh but yeah i mean you're right I mean, as far as just getting this stuff together and, you know, coming together with different things that could actually, you know, move the company forward. I mean, they're coming in on a couple of different routes and this all just makes sense to be involved in this. So, I mean, like you're saying, I mean, the better hash and all that stuff, it's just great to see all that stuff being developed. And, you know, it's like, who's going to actually work on this stuff? I don't know, but it is pretty amazing that they've been working on this kind of stuff in secret since 2017 and they managed to keep all those leaks out. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, like you were saying, I get where people are a little worried about, oh, you know, just this company's big and they've already been like, you know, the center of whatever the universe, I guess they're trying to take over the, like, you know, that narrative. And so they see this and they just run with it. But you know what, it's six X a hash. It's less than 10% of the hash rate right now, but it is a lot of good stuff going on as far as development over there. Yeah, and I mean that's not even what they're they're hosting there. That's what they have electricity for. Like what Blockstream is actually mining with, like their own equipment, they're self mining with, is less than one percent of the Bitcoin network. So it's like ultimately, like all it's like fuck the the conspiracy shit. You know, they're doing a lot of interesting things that are really taking advantage of the whole spectrum you know, between centralized and decentralized or trusted and trustless and just applying it in really interesting ways. And like I said, like they're one of the companies that's like defying this trend of like exploding in use and like innovation and then just like drying up and having nothing. Like this is, you know, not only I think a company that's going to be around for a while, but just the model of how they have approached the space, I think is just in general going to be the successful model, like long term, patient, like infrastructure and product building, and not just the, the, the coin base route mindlessly chasing whatever is the most popular shit coin today.
yeah, I mean, that's it. So, no par, Janine, do you guys got any comment on Blockstream getting set up in the mining industry? No, I just, uh, I think some people in the chat are frustrated that we're blocking their stress testing stream. <laughs> well, they found a pretty good vulnerability. We'd have to, like, shut down and come back. Too but... bad. So sad. No par, you got any comments on Blockstream doing some mining? No, I don't. The conspiracies will continue. That's okay, though. Dude, like, how do you guys have absolutely nothing to say about such a massive dynamic change in infrastructure in this space? Boggles my mind. I actually do, but all fair. The real question is, why do you have so much to say? <laughs> <laughs> because this space is not just going to stop because things don't fit people's perfect idea of perfect decentralization, and like the, this, like this is not a space to disconnect from reality, like people are in, in politics nowadays. Like everybody should actually be paying attention to what's really happening. What's really happening? I'm just joking. You're right. I'm just trying to push the conspiracies along. The kind of infrastructure is being built out in North America to host the kinds and, and the, the amount and the scale of mining equipment that a lot of these hosting farms in China can hold. And that's a massive thing. Like yeah. half of the network's hash rate or around there is concentrated in China right now. And there really just isn't the capacity for it to move many other places. While Blockstream is building the, the places with the capacity that it could move. Yeah, I mean, that's been a big issue, of, you know, long time running as far as like the development and just setting up with the cheap electricity, the fabs are over there and everything. So, yeah, I mean, it's good to have those guys that are specialists that can help develop this thing that gives the profit incentive for this network to kind of formulate and say, hey, you know, it's important that we build this thing up here because, you know, yeah, I mean, this thing's supposed to be decentralized like this so that as much as we can get it out to make it this robust system because yeah like we're about to get into later on in the show there's a lot of stuff going on that you know we should be paying attention to as it relates to ourselves in china mm -hmm. well i guess if that's that's a wrap on this first story no para i believe you had uh some issues with something to to go into next Yes, uh, this is going to be very useful information for all our all the repel holders who are listening to the digest, <laughs> which I'm sure there is many. So GitHub uh, XRP custodial wallet got hacked, and actually one of my friend uh, lost half of his life savings on that uh, on that service, and. So this is public information. There were news about it that it got hacked. But what was really interesting is that he sent them a message. It wasn't even much. It was just a thousand dollar that he he lost there. But <clears throat> but he sent them a message, and the reply was that he should contact his local authorities about this, which was well, I mean, you lost the you lost his money like uh, contact the police and make an investigation against you or what's, what's going on anyway this was just a quick quick note GitHub. hey officers um you know the the sentient um computer virus from sirius came down and stole my gorp gorp credits and uh went through the microsoft wormhole uh, can you guys track him down? Like, do you, do you guys think you're going to be able to get my money back? 
So Microsoft would never lose your money either, for one. The other thing is I don't have to feel that bad about him because he was holding Reaper. I mean, why would anyone do that? <laughs> One they, um, nice, nice inner fanboy uh, release there, and second, obviously, uh, Microsoft didn't lose the money. The sentient AI used their super robust wormhole to escape with the money. Duh. Microsoft won't lose your money, but they will steal your ebooks. Um. But yeah, I mean, um. Yeah, I mean, this is just a double lesson here. Um, you shouldn't trust um, shit coins. And also, um, you should not trust a custodian without a lot of thought. And, um, you know, especially thought about the recourse you have if anything happens to the money that they're holding for you. But, yeah. Uh, that sucks. Hope you actually learned. Yeah, I mean, come on. Holding Ripple? You, somebody needs to learn something over there. It's like he has he has me who, who, who was telling him, do not hold Ripple. Do hold your own keys. And for years, it's like not listening. <laughs> anyway, Man, speaking you about holding other people's money. Uh, let's go to Coinbase now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, I'm sorry. Um, I was supposed to be listening to something. Put on. Get it? Get it? Okay, yeah. that was just too deep. You lost it. <laughs> too, 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 too meta for you guys. Too intelligent for you guys. All right. So, I hate this moment because right now is one of those moments that I actually have to talk about Coinbase in a positive light. And I hate it. It makes my stomach feel sick. And, and, and I hate myself for the rest of the day. So, um, you, you can still cut it out. Mm -mm. <laughs> so, pretty much. Um, there, there are some things I want to preface this with before I go into it. Obviously, the reason that Coinbase um, made this post and this announcement regarding the attempted hack against them, uh, I'll be going into, is PR to make themselves look good. Obviously. I mean, if, if that's not the first thing you think, I'm sorry. Um, you're probably not going to do well in life. Now, that said, the, the reason I, I am eventually going to get around to complimenting them on this and still going into it is to just show like the, the small iterations in sophistication that are happening in, in these types of, of attacks and try to give people an idea and, and a context of like what the, the future really has in store for this. So this, this attempted attack pretty much builds on two zero days in Firefox. Um, one of which that allows JavaScript to jump uh, out of a page into the browser. And then another one that allows um, escape completely from the browser sandbox to just be able to execute native code on the host computer. And the, there's two real interesting fingerprints here in that how these two vulnerabilities were exploited. Um, one of them, um, the exploit used to jump from the page to the browser was known about by Google's Project Zero um, that looks for zero day exploits and things. But the exploit used in this attack was done and structured differently than the proof of concept that the Google Project Zero came up with. So this is showing that this 
this vulnerability was independently discovered here and the attacker learning of it had nothing to do with Google's zero day research. And the, the second one was a zero day that's been around for a while, but the way that it was triggered in this specific exploit was only something um, possible since May 12th. And like all of this started happening around May 30th this year. So within half a month, a brand new way to trigger an exploit that was just made possible was discovered, analyzed, and incorporated into this attack. So somebody who is not only capable of independently discovering this level of exploit themselves, but who is also capable of taking that discovery and streamlining an actual exploit from it very quickly. And with these two vulnerabilities, they comp or not, I'm sorry, not with these, but in combination with these vulnerabilities, they and compromising the University of Cambridge's network to set up uh, fake email addresses and pages under their domain, they pretended to be a representative of the Adam Smith Prize, um, something that's more of a, an economics um, reward or, or prize nowadays, but used to be more just a uh, well-written essays on any subject but in any way they, they kind of blasted this out um, to or an email out to a couple hundred people at the company and then started narrowing it down under the guise of looking for independent experts who could assess and judge things for this prize until it got down to around two percent of the people and then dumped the exploits into the link to the exploits and actually attempt to perform the attack. And so this is where Coinbase actually, you know, caught the attack and noticed um, browsers on their network and their system spawning system shells. And pretty much um, the, the first, like it was broken up into two stages from what they saw deployed, something that hit the device, um, scanned for all their credentials, so any kind of SSH, or SSH keys, uh, GPG keys, you know, any, any kind of access credentials, and then um, deploy a second stage that was actually a remote or a full-fledged remote access tool. And so even here, they were kind of narrowing things down further. And after a, a device had been compromised and credentials scanned, the deployment of the next tool was selected, seeming to only look for you know somebody who could actually be used to uh, access anything worth exploiting. And so Coinbase pretty much you know saw this happen on their, their network immediately and isolated the system, uh, revoked all of the credentials on that device, all of that user's accounts and uh, reported uh, Cambridge's systems compromised to them and then started assessing the situation. But, you know, this is, you know, to, to finally get around to the compliment, like this is, as I've said many times, the one thing I can say Coinbase has actually done very well through their whole history as a company is security, managing the, the security of their funds, their systems and you know they have not ever suffered a massive systemic loss of funds or hack like many other exchanges in this ecosystem that we know and of fair enough that we know but they the, also the, hired some surveillance assholes the the point is though like look at the just the level of, of sophistication in this like an actual plausible cover to try to socially engineer people into a complete zero day in, in a browser to very quickly and targetedly start searching for any kind of access credentials on the system that could get access to anything meaningful and like this is this is not gonna stop like there, there there is no shortages of people who would want to pull off an attack like this there is no shortage of motivation 
to do something like this. And the, those, those things are just going to keep growing and growing over time. And as long as this, as long as Bitcoin exists, like the motive to try to find exploits in, in software, in, in protocols, in hardware is going to exist and people are going to do it. And I mean, like this, this really fundamentally is going to change how we have to look at computer security if we want this kind of monetary asset, this, this digital asset to exist in the world. And, you know, Coinbase did well with this. They've done well historically, but when is the day going to come when they don't, when they get slack or they, they, they lax off, they, they don't keep up with things, keep innovating, keep thinking from the, the perspective of the attacker. And I mean, that's when that happens, like they're going to be ruined. And I mean, that's the case for literally any business or actor or individual in this space who is going to interact with these systems. Like that's the state of the world they exist in. All right, man. Well, yeah, I'll say it. I definitely just thought this was a big publicity act. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, they did something and, and, and this is marketing number one. It's like, hey, we did something. Let's make sure we pump out the news about it to make sure people think we're still competent. But yeah, like Janine was whispering, you know, they've, they've definitely done some stuff that's shady in the past. But, and, you know, like you're saying, I mean, all this security holds up to a point. But yeah, I guess we got to you know, compliment them whenever they actually do do something right. Good job on this one, Conbase. Nothing from anybody, really. Good job. Come on, guys, you got nothing on this our favorite punching bag? So I thought actually this is this story is going to be about something else about uh, how the judge ruled uh, against Coinbase just a few days ago on the BCH things. Uh, I thought really that you're gonna rant about that, but it turns out it's not about that. <laughs> No, there, there was no ruling against Coinbase at all. There, there was like them having to sit for an actual trial. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I guess Janine, you got nothing for us on these guys. No. Well, then you can take us right into these other crazy guys. What's going on over there in the uh, Far East? Well, according to Bloomberg, the deputy director uh, for the payments department of the People's Bank of China spoke at some event held by the China Finance 40 Forum and said that the state control, or rather the central bank digital currency that's been in development for a while now would uh, be close to or is close to being out um, but they didn't say anything more specific than that and they also said that um, the PBOC's intention is that the digital currency would replace uh, M0 or the cash in circulation rather than M2 which would generate credit and impact monetary policy so that's pretty bad and uh, the Bloomberg article also states that based on the patents registered by the central bank, consumers and businesses would download a mobile wallet and swap their their one with um, the digital money, which they could then use to make and receive payments. And the PBOC would track every time money changes hands. And then another article um, by Bitcoin Magazine, which specifically focused on um, a part where the deputy director said that the uh, CBDC would feature a layer uh, or a two layer system. Uh, it says that China's central bank would be running the top layer and business institutions would be running the second layer. So essentially, 
the PBOC will convert the digital currency to commercial banks or other operating institutions where the public would acquire it instead of a single layer structure where the central bank issues the digital money directly to the public, end quote. So, yeah, uh, just what you need in a financial system, two massive gatekeepers to your money. So that sounds pretty grim. And, yeah, replacing cash not not good at all well i mean it sounds exactly in line with like what i thought china was working towards <laughs> like since they started looking at the, the technology in this space i mean and it's you know again like why they haven't gone just full out get rid of bitcoin because they want to try and create this this ecosystem where that can exist as a value sink but not let people use it for commerce build their own systems for commerce where you can get those little tech efficiencies but still maintain all the control and i mean the fact like everything you just said like they've looked exactly at like how doing this the the conventional way central banks have talked about would just destroy the economy and so okay we'll figure out a way to do this where it doesn't have these consequences and i mean it's like it's like what else should we expect from them they're a giant dystopian communist nightmare like the, the social credit score system like everything going on politically with their neighbors right now, just the, the, the cliff that their economy is on. Like it's <laughs> like they, they want, they, they, they don't want to just see the, the empire in the world fall. They, they want to see the empire fall and then build the next one. Yeah. And the, the other thing is that they're not even really the first to do, I mean, I don't think any of the Scandinavian countries are using a cryptocurrency like system, but like there's a whole bunch of Western countries that have already replaced cash with basically the same system that was described in this article. The only difference is they're, you know, they don't have massive human rights issues, but like all of those people should understand that they basically prototype this system and, you know, the consequence of that is that other countries who will actually use it to oppress their citizens are going to see then like, look, it works, and they're going to adopt it. And the consequences are for the people living in China are obviously different, but um, like they should, like the countries that kind of spearheaded this model should kind of feel responsible for this because they weren't willing to consider the negative side effects of other countries you know basically copying the same model yeah sorry Rick. no i'm just thinking like yeah like i'm wondering if we talking about like bcash and bsv here like i mean those guys have been involved in these markets for a long time and like they seem to be the only guys over there that are doing i mean like you know there's like yeah these different wallets that are working with other companies and stuff but you're thinking there's something else involved, huh? Okay, well, yeah, like uh, you're saying in the chat, that's not correct. But still, I mean, like you're saying, I mean, this is all part of some big plan as far as bringing in negative interest rates and this idea of just like actually, you know, just implementing this and imposing it on the population seems to be something that China is willing to do because... You know, yeah, we've seen it with the social credit system and the surveillance state that they implemented with like all this new technology that's coming out as far as, you know, smartphones and facial recognition technology. I mean, you know, we have our worries about that sort of thing being developed over here in the West. But I mean, like it is being heavily developed and implemented, prototyped, you know, tested and really is going to give a good example for all these other nations, states that want to create some sort of. Orwellian nightmare like that and you know the idea of just like creating a cryptocurrency where you could track everybody not just track everybody's payments but you could start shutting people down like that you know that's just the next level of this thing where you know the social credit system that's nightmarish enough but like whenever you start really being able to shut down people's to ability to transact 
on daily business. Like, I mean, yeah, now it's getting to a level of power and sophistication that just really needs to be reined in. Well, I mean, you just like, this is technology. You throw it out there and it, it's, it's just a thing. It's neutral. It doesn't tell people how to use it. And I mean, this is why you need to design technology to function properly. I mean, like, look, like all the like cashless payments was developed in the West. And now it's being built out in the East in, in a communist state who ultimately, I, I'm betting, wants to just turn it into a surveillance state and then export it to the rest of the world as they try to replace America as like the, the global hegemon. You're right. I mean, uh, no par. Janine, y'all got any more to comment on this one? No, <laughs> this is this is very sad and and kind of seems unreal to me. I mean, I I'm not sure I can imagine how this how this. Yeah. I mean, so I've I've had a policy for a number of years that I wouldn't. I would never live in any country where cash was not an option. Like, I mean, even if I it was a country where, you know, physical fiat cash was an option, but cryptocurrencies were that, I don't know, I feel like that we're not at the point yet where someone can effectively use cryptocurrencies in the same way as cash. Like, the, the benefits aren't quite the same. So, yeah, I mean, China's already been pretty far along in terms of adoption of, um, you know, app coins and digital currencies. And so this is just one step further along that line. So it's just another place that I would never want to live under these circumstances, in addition to everything else, obviously. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and, uh, you know, like we're, uh, yeah, Shinobi, you were saying, like, you know, this stuff doesn't have really to do with these other networks that have been trying to fight us. It's got more to do with some of these major centralized uh, tech companies and, you know, trying to help institute all this stuff. And like you're saying, I wouldn't want to live under this thumb. And there's some other people that don't either. So let's uh, get into this. We'll see what's uh, <clears throat> going on with this plan. So we've seen measures China has taken uh, with these new technologies and surveillance to create this Orwellian nightmare we're talking about. And this is all based in the borders of China. But this next story, you know, shows that this threat is pushing outward and mainstream sources and these big tech companies are kind of ignoring it. I'm talking about the Hong Kong protest and the recent escalation at the Hong Kong airport, which shut down air traffic to the global hub for a couple of days and nights. According to recent reports, flights have been allowed to resume after the second night of chaos between the protesters and Hong Kong police. This all started back in March 31st of this year when the Hong Kong government was going to pass a bill that would allow the extradition of citizens to mainland China. This was seen as a major step to end the one country, two systems agreement. And this arrangement is set to expire in the coming decades, but Hong Kong is always weary of China's trying to move up its time frame for this reunification. And the unification process would wreck Hong Kong citizens' freedoms and liberties that they enjoy right now as an independent state within China. So this has caused citizens to take American flags in the streets and sing the national anthem to try and show the media the, the, they disagree, the disagreement of the situation over there. However, state-controlled media in China are using these images to paint the narrative that it's our forces that are causing all this mess. And with the added pressure of trade wars and geopolitical might, things have really started to ramp up there on the ground. And during this whole chaos over there the past few days, we haven't seen Hong Kong trending once across social media outlets and major tech news outlets. This is something we should pay attention to as it relates to Bitcoin fundamentals, but also because we are moving more and more into this world where our information outlets are privy that are privy just stand by and let these actions happen in the show notes today we have several tweets from the situation over there the first one is quite graphic and shows a protester who had his eye knocked out and splattered on the ground the second shows a protester ganging up on a policeman protesters ganging up on a policeman to take his baton 
The officer then pulls his gun and everyone scatters. Then there is a journalist being tied up by protesters for openly supporting the police. And then lastly, is a uh, just a couple of days ago, it's a tweet with a mil- military caravan that are just right outside of Hong Kong. So, yeah, we are at this uh, same inflection point of the information war on the ground as we were in Venezuela not too long ago. There are political factions on the ground and they are taking the visuals, violence and veracity of this situation to wield a narrative. And the fundamental situation is that these citizens in Hong Kong enjoy levels of freedoms and liberties mainland China doesn't. And this is a threat to this social credit system and the surveillance system that they've been building a long, for a long time. And uh, yeah, the situation, it's, it's hard to gauge right now because there seems to be wins and losses on both sides. And there's not really a sign of it cooling down. I mean, it's uh, going to be hard to try and figure out what exactly happened in the past 12 to 24 hours that you know, re-enabled flights back in and out of uh, Hong Kong airport over there. So this is just something that's maybe not, uh, you know, entirely Bitcoin related, but I just feel like we had to call some attention to it given the last story and, uh, you know, the media's regard to ignore it. So, uh, yeah, did you guys have any comment about what's going over there with this Hong Kong protest and the potential of a state control, cryptocurrency, and the social credit system, all that stuff moving right into Hong Kong, what kind of effects that would be? And, you know, what do you think of this whole situation? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be a huge shock to the markets over there. I mean, like Hong Kong runs its own stock exchange. Like there are huge capital markets in Hong Kong. And like you, like, even as part of China, it's kind of looked at as like the, that place where markets function more freely. And if China just moved in and just like took over or just like altered the, the current agreement where Hong Kong has this, this autonomy until into the middle of this century, like that would completely change the market's attitude about hong kong and like the the safety of investments or capital there and that would have massive consequences for things and i mean you know let alone just like if if china actually were to send troops into hong kong i mean that just does not bode well for really anybody in the region that they have eyes on as far as avoiding conflict with China in the long term. Well, yeah, I mean, sorry, no part, go ahead. I just wanted to say that the Hong Kong process was, protests in Hong Kong were, were for a very long time happening all the time, and they were always peaceful. Uh, but this time, it seems like they weren't and i just keep talking because my phone just turned off all right so go ahead <laughs> myself now. well yeah this is definitely a situation that's turned violent i mean if you look at it the way that the protesters are treating the police and the way that the police are treating the protesters and like the way that we just basically understand the gaming dynamics of big large protests like this where there are people sent into the protest to behave, you know, in a certain way to where police can behave in a certain way. And then, you know, everything kind of just gets out of control and that's where we're at. And it does seem like um, <clears throat> it's getting dangerous in the sense of like uh, maybe another Tiananmen style event. And, uh, you know, that would just be a nightmare, like you're saying, Shinobi, for the markets. I mean, like if that sort of event happened, um yeah it's really hard to say what exactly would happen on a market sense but just on a human level it would be a you know pretty terrible scenario for uh, anybody yeah it's just something where you know you got to look at it and be like man these guys nowadays it's like they're you know the highways are getting shut down the airports are getting shut down like things are getting really really scary over there i mean like china's been looking at Taiwan and the south china sea for a while now and you know we know hong kong's into this as well it's just hard to say how it's going to shake out, but it's something that we should pay attention to. One of my uh, favorite artists is uh, a woman named 
I think it's Ven King Yan or Wen King Yan. Um, she goes by Yume Art on Twitter, and she's the author of the Fisheye Placebo comic, which is a really cool comic, uh, cypherpunk comic. And um, she tweeted a few days ago um, a piece that she made because I guess some of the protesters have been using umbrellas to not only shield their faces, but also to just put over surveillance cameras as they're moving around the city. And so she tweeted a picture of that and said she was inspired by all the amazing photos from protests in Hong Kong. And um, she was also born in China. So she says that um, having seen all the horrendous abuse of power that happens without democracy, my heart is with the people of Hong Kong. And I hope they will achieve their goals of freedom and inspire others to also fight for their rights to democracy. So check definitely check out her art because um, it's really awesome. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely does. I mean, like people are talking about these visuals of, you know, them holding the American flags and singing the national anthem and showing that there is like strong signs of freedom still that, you know, a lot of people have a hard time thinking like there's anybody that would stand for those things. And, you know, you know these guys over there, there's just not enough credit going on to what they're doing. Like you're saying, I mean, they're not just using these umbrellas to shield their faces. I mean, they're using doctor's masks for that, too. They're also using lasers to try and screw with any cameras that are trying to take facial recognition technology to you know, see who's at these protests and get them later. And, um, yeah, all this stuff is going on. But they're also using, like, Roman tactics where, like, they're using the umbrellas like shields from roman legions that would uh you know cover each other and they're using hand signals to move people from the back to the front like it's really been incredible to see and i think that yeah everybody that you know plans to participate in something that is like a fight like this like i mean you have to look at what they're doing and take note because it's actually effective i mean the fact that they've been able to push back as far as they have and as long as they have right now is pretty incredible and uh like we're saying it's it doesn't look like it's cooling down either way to to my knowledge the masks are used against you know tear gas and the umbrellas are also tear gas and all kind of things that the police are firing at them so it's it's not just uh it's not just looking good it's it's actually has a really really good utility like it was yeah, called the uh, Umbrella Revolution a couple of years ago, 2014 maybe. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a functional piece of armor, you know, and like, yeah, they've been holding up signs also saying that they need the Second Amendment. I mean, like it's, yeah, it's something that we need to see more people uh, discussing because it's really something that's, yeah, I mean, it's a pivotal part in the geopolitics of the markets and you know what all's going on and something definitely to pay attention to with all these trade wars and china doing all this stuff with surveillance and cryptocurrencies shinobi you got any more comment on this i mean not really man it's just like this is a canary in the coal mine as far as just where China is going in the long term, like more totalitarian or more pushback against it. And, you know, I think how things go with Hong Kong ultimately is going to be kind of telling as to how things are going to go in the larger picture in Asia. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at that. So let's move away from something so not so depressing. Okay, so... There are some different takes on this next story. Some people are saying it's not it's uh, much ado about nothing, while others are saying it's pretty big news. So it's most likely somewhere in the middle. But New Zealand recently published their tax information bulletin this month, and it included language to allow citizens of their country to be paid in Bitcoin or crypto assets. Bitcoin is referenced 18 times in the document, while everything else is labeled crypto assets. So in order for an employee to be paid in Bitcoin, they would need to come to an arrangement with their employer on the percentage of their salary to be paid in Bitcoin. It would have to be regular payments in the crypto of choice and can be converted directly into a fiat from an exchange and either a significant purpose of the crypto asset is to function like a currency or the value of the crypto asset is pegged to one or more fiat currencies. 
These payments to employees are labeled as pay income payments under SRD3 in the tax code over there. So, yeah, I mean, it looks like a pretty big deal to me in the fact that there is now clear guidance so uh, New Zealanders can be paid in Bitcoin. I mean, we might still see the market reality that not many people take up the offer and aren't comfortable with crypto assets, but it could be a boom and everyone starts to make moves into Bitcoin. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But the guidance is out there. The bill's been passed. Uh, this all begins September 1st. So just right around the corner and a couple of weeks away. We'll have to see how it goes. But uh, yeah. Now, a quick note is that you can't be self-employed and pay yourself in these assets. But otherwise, yeah, it's good to go as far as getting paid in Bitcoin. And all that seems to be up and above board. So what do you guys wait. think? Pretty What? Wait, you can't, so you can't be a freelancer and accept Bitcoin? No, or, well, they're you saying can, you cannot like self employ yourself and right. pay yourself with your own Bitcoin, <laughs> like, like, set a, like, make a company employ yourself and have all your Bitcoins owned by the company paying yourself a tax scam so that you can get around a lot of taxes. Yeah, you can accept payment if you're a freelancer, but like uh, you can't pay yourself. But other than that, I mean, like it seems to be all set up to where, you know, like basically like, yeah, if this passed in here in the United States, you know, and somebody was working at McDonald's, they could be like, hey, you know, I want to start stacking those sets. But I don't know how exactly to do dollar cost averaging and all that stuff on exchanges. So, yeah, you know, I'll get paid 10% of my paycheck in Bitcoin. How many people do you, th you guys think would take that up? At McDonald's, it would, you could be stacking sats instead of fats. <laughs> Honestly, no way more than like 1% of employees and probably way less than that. I mean, yeah. I'm still I'm still caught up on the thing about not being able to pay yourself if you're self-employed. But like, is that a specific stipulation for Bitcoin, or does that also apply in general to like not being allowed to pay yourself from a company? Well, no, it's because that it's you run. Like, imagine this, Janine. Like, you have a bunch of Bitcoin. You have a thousand Bitcoin. So you start an air quote company and then give yourself an air quote job and pay yourself an air quote salary. And now you're just getting paid and paying taxes on your salary instead of all the capital gains on that. It's a tax fraud scam. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. But like that applies generally. That's like a general rule. It's not specific for Bitcoin, right? No, it's not because cash doesn't have the potential to moon a thousand X and leave you with a bunch of capital gains to try to get out of. So this rule is specifically for earning Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. It's just, uh, you know, earn Bitcoin and that's it. Like, um, you know, it's fairly simple just to try and put something in the tax code that I guess they're saying, you know, this is okay. Because, I mean, if that popped up, I think the bigger news would just be like, it would be like, oh, wow, it's okay to get paid in this. So it's okay to hold it. And, you know, maybe it's just like, it's just becoming more, yeah, accepted. So we're going to have some Kiwi Bitcoins running rampant then. A uh, lot more Bitcoiners coming around from the island nation. So uh, outside of that, no part, you just attended a webinar. How'd it go? Yes, it went a couple of, in fact, two hours ago. So it's fresh and you're going to hear the, the hot Chainalysis news on me right now. <laughs> oh, too bad it's not gonna be live. Anyhow, uh, did it, did it, China, did it. I was on a chain. <laughs> I was on a Chainalysis webinar. Cryptocurrency topologies. Who is on the blockchain was the title. So they reiterated their goal is to increase transparency in blockchains. <laughs> uh, this time the speaker was Hannah Curtis. I think she was the first speaker last time. So it started out pretty boring, but interesting, especially towards the end at the answers uh, section when 
they actually asked a couple of things what we we kind of know or at least i was gossiping it here and there because all signs were pointing to that but uh, but it turns out that actually now they are publicly said that hey this is what they can and cannot do okay so um who is on the blockchain miner miners uh holders uh investors traders uh people who are buying and selling goods and services uh people who are stealing and scamming and and mixers so this is what they identified okay now what they also did is that hmm how shall i explain it because it's a nice graph so they put categories of bitcoin businesses uh into a risk scale how, how much risk they take and the lowest who, who don't take much risk are merchant services and mining pools and actually this is where they put a custodial wallets which makes little sense to me but anyhow and then who takes very little still medium to little risk is that icos exchanges exchanges take more risk i don't know why anyway gambling cryptocurrency atms and now uh, medium to high risks are mixers darknet markets and ransomware users uh, high risk uh, hackers and st stealing funds and scammers and severe risk uh, terrorists financing child abuse material and sanctions and actually uh, i'm gonna come back to the terrorist things because this might have been the only 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 uh time when i actually seen that hey terrorists are indeed using bitcoin so anyhow let's move on to a couple of interesting facts about bitcoin atms uh five to six atms five to six thousand atms there are worldwide uh, 74 percent is in north america 22 percent is in europe and the rest is asia and everywhere else <clears throat> so interesting things are that custodial wallets so the wallets those are holding other people's money are increasing uh, their adoption uh, compared to other type of wallets so that's not a good trend there their adoption is increasing uh, another interesting thing is that esports are one of the category that one of the thing that industry that adopted bitcoin and still adopting and esports are rapidly increasing popularity and using and using cryptocurrencies okay so and now a couple of things about the largest icos i think it might be interesting so eos eos was the largest ico which raised 4.1 billion dollar telegram the second largest ico 1.7 billion dollar there and from their own dragon coin uh, 300 million huobi 300 million uh dots i don't even know what's that 250 million five coin 250 million i don't know why ethereum is not here maybe they didn't raise that much money anyhow now <clears throat> this is where it gets interesting so bitcoin mixers they talked about bitcoin mixers and what are bitcoin mixers websites or software for obfuscating the source of funds how it works no know your customer required exist on the clear net and the dark net typically centrally controlled examples chip mixer crypto mixer and bitcoin fog risk type high 
possible exploit mostly for cryptocurrency that's been stolen or from darknet market so right uh, so far they didn't talk about uh, uh, bitcoin mixers like uh, wasabi or other kind of mixers uh, or join market and now this was the first slide where they put emerging trends so what are the emerging trends in bitcoin mixers uh, law enforcement shutdowns and voluntary shutdowns and also decentralized mixing protocols are emerging like coin join and cash shuffle uh, which is strange because coin join is a protocol cash shuffle is uh, an actual implementation based on coin shuffle uh, which is based on coin join <laughs> anyhow and now on the next slide they actually put up decentralized protocols uh, they say it's faster and easier mixing, uh, which is decentralized protocols, and they put Wasabi Wallet and Electron Cash with Cash Shuffle. So they somehow think these product, these things are decentralized, and their their selling point is that they are faster and easier mixing, which as this just this just shows to me that how much they don't understand what's going on. Of course, the selling point to the centralized traditional mixers is that uh, it's trustless uh, from a privacy point of view and non cost to the uh, so it's it's not even faster and maybe not even easier. Uh, but anyhow and. I wouldn't even say it's decentralized, although the decentralizing who stores the money that that uh, but I don't think they they went that far with that. Uh, another graph they show the uh, actually Wasabi Wallet has received two hundred plus million year to date in two thousand nineteen and. They showed a nice graph where where Wasabi's volume was increasing exponentially, which is nice. <laughs> and then, uh, this is okay. Mixers are over. Monero is the preferred privacy coin. Uh, and they were showing that hey, uh, inc there are increasing uh, adoption in terrorist groups, and they were actually showing how terrorist groups were posting about Bitcoin on social media and things like that. Hey, donate to us, uh, which is well, now there is evidence that terrorists are indeed using Bitcoin. Uh, I've seen so that's 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 not very encouraging there. Anyway, where do dark net markets found come from? Uh, that was the next next thing they talked about, and you might have remembered that I talked about it before. That hey, dark net markets from dark net markets, people were sending uh, directly to exchanges, which is which is what's happening. But this is the other way around. Where do the money coming from? To darknet markets. So where do where do the money comes from? It's a uh, fifty four percent is directly from exchanges, um, twenty three percent from peer to peer exchanges, sixteen percent they couldn't figure out, <laughs> and from darknet market to darknet market is two point five percent. Uh, zero percent coin gener generation. Uh, zero point five percent is hosted wallet, which probably means custodial wallet, I think. Uh, and merchants zero point four percent, and zero point five percent from mixing, only zero point five percent, which is wow. 
Anyhow, the other interesting slide that they had is where do mixers receive funds from, and what was the what was their what what they found is forty percent of mixers receiving funds from actually exchanges, and seven point seven percent peer to peer exchanges. Um, 26.8% is actually coming from other mixing services. 0.8% <laughs> uh, mining pool. 1.9% uh, gambling. 2.7% uh, darknet markets. 0.2% coin generation. 10.4% they couldn't figure out. And 7.8.1% and stolen found. So if you are looking at it that uh darknet market and stolen funds are the only things those could anyone uh looking at the blockchain would 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 ultimately flag and and this is a so so it's just 10 percent that's 10 percent so to say dirty coins are coming to the mixers and these are I, I, i'm not quite sure what's the what's the volume between like wasabi and joy market compared to centralized mixers but i would say that centralized mixers are still kings here so they are still uh, owning the market and uh, our volume is nothing compared to theirs so that's how you should interpret this result if you are thinking about Wasabi. All right, now let's get to the questions and answers. And the first question was, aren't mixers untraceable? And her answer was, we can identify funds going into these mixing services. And quote, this is what she said, a common misconception is that you can trace the funds in and out, but for the most part, you really can't. Once funds go into a service, for the most part, it's not generally traceable. So this just confirms everything, right? And then she isn't even talking about Wasabi at this point. She's talking about even exchanges and and other centralized services that they they are losing they are losing the the trace there so that that was really interesting that anyhow oh yeah and the other other question was is that uh, so if i send from a mixer to an exchange is it an illicit activity and her answer was quoting no, that's not necessarily. A lot of people are using mixers for personal privacy. And that's about mixers. The last question I wrote out was about ICOs. Uh, our ICOs are coming to an end. And she, her opinion is no. Only the high volume ICOs seem to be tapering off. Uh, but other forms of ICUs are emerging uh, because they have to figure out some way to to overcome the regulatory shut uh, regulatory um, <clears throat> clampdown that that they are experiencing on ICUs currently. So this was an interesting uh, webinar. I. I think they, they, they talked about a lot of different things in a in very, not, not very coherent way, but, but I, 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 I certainly become smarter from this. So that, that, that was it. Um, any, anything you guys want to add about it or grab your attention? Yeah, I want like... I really wanted to kind of go back to the classification of Wasabi as a decentralized mixer. I mean, like that's 
unless they're like talking specifically just in terms of like information that the server has or something like that just shows such a failure to understand what's going on there like if that's the genuine state of understanding like they are so screwed when like lightning goes live more stuff builds on coin joins like when you start having things like taproot roll out like they're gonna have no clue what the hell is going on from this presentation i would say they already don't i mean not i would say it what she said they, they already don't well then yeah like if that's genuinely the case and there is not some kind of analytics cutting head or cutting edge way beyond what chain analysis has then like yeah i don't see what's so completely dismal about bitcoin privacy as long as people go in and out of kyc like gardens properly I mean, I guess we can, it's kind of hard to tell because I don't know, it, do you know what this woman who is speaking, does she actually, I, I don't think she's a developer actually, chain analysis, she's basically someone who does PR stuff, it sounds like, because that would explain so, why she's not articulating things properly. So she's not she's a researcher uh, how the, how these webinars are usually going is that there is a there is a pr woman who introduces the researcher for the audience and it was the first five seminars was kim grauer and now the last two was hannah curtis so 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 she's definitely a researcher here or data analyst or data scientist i, I don't know something like that yeah so it's i mean it's possible that she's just not correctly articulating things because her understanding is limited or skewed and maybe it's better for other people who are actually building and maintaining the software that they run but yeah i mean that's i mean if they're saying that they can't even really identify stuff going in and out of these mixers or they can identify going in but not going out i mean that's that's pretty bad for them so so also this whole slide i i, I tell you what this slide is decentralized protocols faster and easier mixing a big wasabi logo a big electron cash logo uh, coin join protocol bitcoin under the Wasabi logo, Cash Shuffle Protocol, BCH, under the Electron Cash logo. Now, there are so many things wrong with this site. Uh, let, let's start with it. These protocols are not completely decentralized. Uh, th these are probably not offering faster nor easier mixing. Uh, that's, that's just not the selling point. Uh, okay, the Wasabi logo, you copy paste, uh, picture there you can't get get too many things wrong there but the electron cash logo what 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 the heck electron cash is the bch fork of electron uh wait electrum yes the bch fork of electrum wallet uh so that's electron cash and the cash of cash shuffle is actually the plugin that you can use to mix bch with coin shuffle protocol which is also coin join but 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 cash shuffle is not a protocol it's an implementation and then under the wasabi logo you put coin join protocol and then cash shuffle protocol just so many misconception and misunderstanding in in just one one simple slide that wow <laughs> So in yeah. other words, you're studying your enemy in depthly right now, and they don't know the first thing about this. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah, I think I mean that doesn't that doesn't really surprise me because if I remember correctly, uh, when you were 
talking about a previous session. Actually, it was this. It was a session that I attended. Um, I think, and one of the things she said was that I think she listed Signal and Telegram as decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encrypted messaging services or something weird like. That. That. and i was like no signal is really centralized um, and telegram is barely an encrypted messaging app so yeah i mean i'm i'm not surprised but it is kind of hilarious which i mean if we want to talk about it now is why i'm so excited to start some kind of usterfuck club based on the term that you came up with <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just a quick quick note there that did, did you guys, I completely missed it. I didn't know Telegram was doing uh, ICO and let alone raised $1.2 billion from it. Uh, did you guys know about it? Oh, yeah. Those guys were like the, one of the, I mean, they were one of the first like where it was like, oh, a legit company is trying to do an ICO. I thought it was either them or um, WeChat or one of those uh, messaging you know, encrypted messaging apps. Yeah, but don't don't touch it. All right. If you guys don't have any comment, then I think we can move on to the next topic. Shinobi, were you trying to say something? We couldn't hear you. No, I was just going to say, like, I don't care about ICOs anymore. Um, that That is beneath me. <laughs> it's not just beneath you, man. I think everybody's tired of it. Like, uh, I mean, you didn't hear? I mean, Stop and Decrypt's been posted, man. It's all about DeFi now. All right, yeah, like, so we should probably go into the next one. So, uh, yeah, Janine, you want to tell us about what's going on with some IOTA dudes? Yeah, so I don't think we've talked about IOTA for a while, and one would think that that would be a good sign that they weren't really generating any news. Uh, like, maybe they just finally dropped dead in a shitcoin grave and ascended to shitcoin heaven, but no. <laughs> um, they're still around, and um, I've talked about IOTA a few times on Block Digest, and I think, in fact, the first episode that... I was on, um, I think my main story in episode 18 was about IOTA. So just a reminder, um, I mean, if you don't want to listen to all of that, these are the same people who um, deliberately, well, we don't know. It might have been an accident. They claim it was deliberate, but it's still stupid either way. Uh, they claim that they deliberately included a vulnerability in their hash algorithm way back when as a copy protection mechanism and then... Yeah, they kind of named it improperly and didn't give credit, but whatever. If uh, you haven't noticed, which you should have by now, but Sarah Jamie Lewis, who is the executive director of the Open Privacy Research Society, has been uh, spending a lot of time tearing down their claims of being decentralized or secure or interesting in any way for a long while. Iota's interactions with her have been particularly stupid and hilarious. Um, or rather, their responses have been. And there's a iota focus blog called Tangle Blog. And they have apparently been threatening Sarah once again for speaking low of their shitty project. So yesterday she tweeted out a very long DM that someone from Tangle Blog um, sent. I assume it's like, I have no idea how Tangle Blog functions, but I assume whoever runs it, that's what it seems like to me. And so I'm going to read it because it's kind of weird and funny and disgusting. So he says, hello, Sarah, this is a fair heads up for you as I'm planning on writing an article about you and your deeds. Hans Moog or Mog repeatedly reached out to you very politely, technically open for your honest expertise. And you answered with hate and belittlement. You misinterpreted his words on purpose just to hate Iota even more. This was against him as a person, and it was also against the other people in the Iota Foundation. People with kids, dreams, and pressure in their lives. Not machines. 
so much malice from a person that is advocating tolerance. Since you're attacking a nonprofit organization and openly accuse them of selling fake oil and um, scamming people, I will publish an article about your business conduct in the next week. Every issue between people can be solved, especially Hans is the calmest, most open person there is in the foundation, and yet you attack him just for your own pleasure. And it continues... Um, you have two weeks to address Hans questions openly in a scientific way without any attacks against persons or purposeful misrepresentation. Otherwise, I will release the article and send it to every nonprofit and organization connected to your own. You think you can behave like you want on social media? You will see the downside of openly lying and spreading misinformation very soon because there are so many honest, hardworking people that are trying to improve things out there including for people that are on the other side of the wealth fence with, uh, I don't know what the first one is, UN Ops and ID 2020. Yet you attack them just because you feel attacked by trolls that were in the IOTA community and that were banned instantly. IOTA is very harsh, harsh with our trolls and bigots in their, in their own community, so don't think this is in any way connected to that. Bad people are bad, I know that, but it remains to be seen if you're one of them. Two weeks, 27th of August, 6 o'clock CEST. Oh, that tells me uh, we're there, base. I know you think I'm bluffing, but please remember that Amy Castor lost her job after people released the true nature of her work. I have no idea what that's referring to, but <laughs> this, will be no, this will be no difference because you are openly lying, probably because you're invested in Bitcoin, Zcash, and Monero. I know you're blocking me soon, but that won't stop my schedule or the article. I'm living for 10 years in my city where I met some of the greatest, kindest, tolerant people in the LGBT community. You're different. I approve that you openly discuss this message or even share it on social media. It's my approach and it's not connected to the Iota Foundation. Nor do they know what I'm. Nor do they know that I'm doing this. The official stance is everyone leave her alone. We just have to prove that she's wrong. But I'm not okay with this. Do things right or I do it. End quote. So that was very long, but I felt like reading it because um, that I'm going to, because uh, uh, that basically justified what Sarah responded with. Um, so she responded publicly on Twitter to this after posting the DM message and again pointed out in a very long thread all of the issues that she's noticed with IOTA's model and also their conduct. Um, she addressed that. So she said, um, do... Um, she asked, do IOTA and their independent associates have a history of harassing researchers who point out flaws in their technology? Yes, you can just go Google this one. Now, let me be serious, Tanglebog. Please do publish that article about me, if only so that I recover the modicum of dignity I sacrificed to dance your jig to write a thread that will hopefully steer people away from a miserable little scam coin. I'm secure in my integrity. Finally, I must address the threats. It's laughable for many reasons, the main one being that open privacy has no organizational supporters to threaten. No one will fund marginalized privacy anyway. All that support we get is independent. But in another way, it's disgusting. Throughout my life, I've been threatened with bullies who sought to use whatever they considered a weakness of mine. I've been threatened with lawsuit oblivion by multinational corporations, and I was once chased down the street for holding my partner's hand. I've spent years of my life shaping it uh, such that my morals, ethics, and work were aligned. I'm entirely happy with who I am and the decisions I made that got me here. So understand that your threats ring hollow, but also understand that I won't stop until they cease to ring. So yeah, um, if you have any uh, disposable income, uh, you should probably donate it to Open Privacy or Sarah specifically. Um, they, I think they both... Uh, I know Open Privacy does, but I'm not sure Sarah does individually. They both, I think, accept Bitcoin. Uh, if you want to see more of these awesome IOTA takedowns. <laughs> yes, please donate because uh, I want to see this. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, like I'm looking into it like this is about harassment of technology and like they're saying that you hate and belittlement just because of the fact that you're talking about how something could be scamming someone. I mean, this is just this stuff has to get shut down. I hate the fact that people are shutting down speech instead of trying to have a battle of ideas by doing this. Like you're making people feel bad. And especially when it's bu built off of technical merits. I mean, 
come on, like probably because you're invested in Bitcoin, Zcash, and Monero, like it's like they're just immediately trying to take the position of like, hey, you have bags you're trying to defend, so like uh, you can't. Well, I'm gonna say I'm gonna shut your speech down because you're harassing me and uh, the science that I believe in. Your science is wrong. <sighs> this is this is crazy. I know you you got something to say, huh, Sheena? You invested in space rockets and and say that that my fucking space catapult is impossible how 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 am i different than you huh how how is that different than me saying the rockets bullshit huh huh explain it to me right now explain it well this is where it's like, yeah, this is ridiculous. Explain it or I'm going to try and get your job away by, you know, publishing an article that says you're a mean person. Like, God, this thing has to stop. Like, you know, all this stuff going on and then you see people doing this. Like, yeah, I don't know what else to say other than this is ridiculous. Please donate to uh, Sarah here and let's get some more of these awesome IOTA stories popping yeah that's my favorite part where they're like how dare you not answer our scientific questions if you don't answer us in a scientific manner by this specific time on this specific day we're going to try to ruin your reputation <laughs> in a non-scientific way <laughs> like what is that oh the world of the crazy science that's what that no, is no 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 it's just science it, it, it's science that's how science works guys it's science <gasps> all right no party you got any comment on science of technology and hatred and all that no because i'm not quite yes but i'm not quite sure what's the what's really going on i i think this story is really deep what what i've been wondering about is that wasn't it IOTA that created their own homegrown uh, hash function or some yes. kind of yep. function? Yep. And Ethan Hellman was the one who actually found that. Well, that's 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 really fucked up. And yep. then they started to bully Ethan for it. It was IOTA. Yeah. So if you want to. If anyone isn't aware of this, you can go back to, I think it was in episode 18. It's somewhere around there, one of the early episodes. Um, but I talked about what happened with that situation. And the short of it is that Ethan found a vulnerability in their hash algorithm. And then when he disclosed that, um, they said, oh, this is not a vulnerability. We put that there on purpose. It was a copy protection mechanism so that if anyone forks the IOTA code, uh, then we can take advantage of the not vulnerability and shut down their network. And it was like, yeah, <laughs> you're a bunch of idiots. <laughs> no, like we're either, not. either, either way, either way, you are idiots. <laughs> no, no, we just we're smart, and that's why we, we caught the cheaters. There is so many layers of wrong with that <laughs> reasoning <isn't it>? there. <laughs> What, we were trying to catch the cheaters and play plagiarizers, and then you're, they wanted to a plagiarizer, I bet. So basically, I mean, part of it was roll your own, but they actually they actually copied. Um, I think it was Vin Winter Signatures. I can't remember the exact name of it. Um, but they had copied someone else's work and basically I, this might have been actually the signature algorithm. I think they copied the signature algorithm and then when they changed it or updated it or, or whatever to remove this, you know, this thing that wasn't a vulnerability was apparently a vulnerability enough for them to fix it. Um, they then like memorialized the um, the name of the previous or the hash, the name of the hash algorithm that they were using and, and like not giving proper credit to the work that they copied and it was really stupid so yeah there it is like they're the ones being technical meaning like you know whatever they want to push hatred whatever man it's iota this thing needs to end <laughs> whatever's all the way down
All right, you guys want to hear another whatever story? Uh, whatever. <laughs> I did not decide yet if I want to hear another whatever story. I know what, whatever. <laughs> All right. So, should be no surprise to anyone, a couple of days ago, on August the 12th, the SEC once again denied the ETFs on file. Those would be the Bitwise, VanEck, SolidX, and Wilshire Phoenix ETFs. Those were filed earlier this year in February and June, and this marks the first decision on those new filings in the 240-day uh, evaluation period. The final decision for the Wilshire Phoenix is coming up on September 29th, then Bitwise and Van Eck are set to expire on October 13th and 18th. We all know there could be more delays and refilings that could continue to drag on this process. And uh, yeah, we know the SEC has been pretty standoffish with the entire industry. The same goes with the IRS. And yeah, this is just them sticking to that sentiment. Everyone knows this is commonplace by now. I mean, we got Stop and Decrypt's tweet in the show notes where he says this is just becoming the next China bans Bitcoin headline. It was denied, and I don't think the price moved at all from that information. But yeah, one day these ETFs are bound to get through. In the meantime, all kinds of on-ramps for the traditional markets are starting to come online. I mean, we've got the Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, and beta, back, beta backed contracts that are exist today. And these new on-ramps are still just getting started. You know, they're taking in these new market participants right now and these, you know, this slow opening process of it. So, yeah, one might ask why we still need this ETF at this point, but there are a lot of people who won't invest until something like this product comes around. So maybe one day, you know, we're going to, you know, we'll see this headline where it's an ETF in there and it'll shock us all and we'll see some crazy market moves. But for right now, I think this just, yeah, falls kind of in the whatever news category. I don't know. Did you guys have anything to say about ETF denials once more? Wait, what? They put off denying or approving the ETF right after the federal government just reamed Facebook up the ass for talking about launching a crypto due to the macroeconomic consequences. I'm so shocked. Like, I'm so <laughs> shocked, dude. Like, I did not see this coming. Like, oh my God, I am shocked. Well, yeah, that's it. It's a shocking story, man. I mean, you know, these ETFs. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really good point, actually. I wasn't even thinking about that. But like the optics of trying to approve an ETF after what just happened with Facebook would look awful. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. We'll probably see these headlines for maybe another year, it feels like. I mean, seems like one day it's going to get through and it's going to shock us. But it might be a year or two years. I, I don't know. I'm just shocked. Like, no par. Janine, are you guys just as shocked as I am? Yes, I'm truly shocked. I was not expecting this whatsoever. Yeah, me neither. Barry Silbert promised us an ETF in 2014. In two weeks. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about as shocked as I am skeptical of whether tomorrow is really one day away. Uh, it's just 11 hours away now. Tomorrow, tomorrow. All right. It's only a day away. <laughs> Janine, you want to tell, take us into this last story? There's something to laugh about with the SEC here. Yeah, so I saw this because of a tweet. I still don't know how, how to pronounce this handle, but it's Ar Arbadao or something. Um, anyway, it's linked in the, <laughs> it's linked in the, the show notes. My man Reggie. Um, so, I don't know, again, it, this is a shitcoin fuck-up story, but uh, first I want to note Veritasium. Um, this entire time, up until I read this um, document from the SEC, I was under the impression that it was Veritaserum from Harry Potter, which is like the truth-telling serum. So, yeah, 
now my my day is ruined. Um, so apparently the SEC, uh, they recently filed an emergency lawsuit um, in Brooklyn to prevent uh, Veritasium from spending, quote, $8 million from an ICO that the SEC contends was fraudulently undertaken in 2017 and early 2018. And um, let me get the document really quick. So in the actual um, motion, it says, this is an emergency action to stop the defendant's further dissipation of the approximately $8 million of investor proceeds that remain from the approximately $14.8 million they fraudulently raised in 2017 and early 2018 in an offering of digital securities. The defendants, a Brooklyn-based self-described financial guru who goes by the name of Reginald, I don't remember his last name, but Reginald, uh, and two companies he controls raised the $14.8 million by making material misrepresentations and omissions about the unregistered securities they offered, digital assets called Veritokens, Veri, or Veritas. Um, defendants conducted this offering in a so-called initial coin offering took place, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the the funniest part <laughs> about this document and the part that I first saw of it from that initial tweet was uh, paragraph 10, where it says, On July 30th, 2019, the day that commission staff informed defendant's counsel that the staff was likely to recommend the commission approve the filing of an enforcement action against the defendants, uh, on July 31st, uh, the defendants moved about $2 million in remaining offering proceeds from a blockchain address they controlled into other addresses and used a portion of those funds to purchase more precious metals. <laughs> so, Reggie Middleton, yes, good job, Reginald, <laughs> with, your, with your ear trying to buy precious metals with your disputed funds right after you're informed that you might lose them. Good job, buddy. My man, Reggie! Yeah! Oh, man, Reggie. <laughs> Reggie, Reggie. Yeah, this this guy takes me back. Like, oh my god, like, years ago. Well, before this even launched, I got to, like, talk to this guy in Whalepool because he kept <laughs> just trying to, like, sell everybody in Whalepool on Veritasium. And, like, he just kept trying to, like, shill it as just, like, this perfect, like, decentralized, like, capital market <clears throat> where, like, people can invest in things without, like, all the, the middlemen in the middle and bullshit. And it's, like, I, like, th this is so long ago, like, I couldn't i could not pull the, the the all the details out of my head but it just even on an economic level something about it just was like no this is nonsense and this is not gonna work like not even like the tech or the ethereum or all the smart contract bullshit just like the economic investment model and like i just kept fucking telling him like dude this is nonsense like blah 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 like things will just flow into Bitcoin and this will implode. And he just he just kept going, nope, nope, like the just just think about it. <laughs> and it's like there, there were a couple times for like a week or two where he'd just come in and it would be this with a whole room full of people for hours. And then I look over a day or so ago and I see on the news desk who whose name do I see pop up? My man Reggie <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I just, there's actually um, the paragraph right after the one that I read, uh, number 11, it's actually even better. So it says, commission staff requested through counsel that the defendants voluntarily agree not to engage in further dissipation of the offering proceeds, including through the purchase of precious metals. Defendants, through counsel, declined the staff's request. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. It's good to see one of these stories come back around. And it's just, it's, it's like, you know, this is, this is it. This is like, I, I finally can look and it's like, back when this, this idea was first born as just a purely idiotic idea, 
I got to be one of the people right there when it was born explaining to to its dad it's retarded. And I, I, instead, I got to be the instead, one. Instead, you could have get in no, early. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, my point is like I, 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 I was there at the moment of birth to tell him your your child is a retard. And and I could say that, and I was there for that, and I witnessed it, and I know it was in depth explained in a way that it's you had to understand that like he, it's a retard, and he refused to accept it. And now firsthand, I get to witness it, it like all the events start unfolding to, to finally make him realize that it's retarded. And it's like, this is just, I love this. Like, I, it's like, I've, cause I've never had, I've never had this happen in like this personal way where it's like, I know this person and right when this idea was like popping into their head and like forming, it's like, no dude, that's retarded. And like it's it's always just the idea that like I was never there in that way for it. But it's this one, nope. I, I was there for it. I, I called it. It was retarded. <laughs> it was your it was your chance to get rich quick, Shinobi. And you missed it. And now you are trying <laughs> to justify it. No, no need for excuses. <laughs> no, I really just seized on the opportunity to make the retarded baby analogy because I just thought that would be way over the line and funny. Yep. I know, I know. All right, yeah. now. Reggie, 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 Reggie. Reggie, Reggie. I told you it was retarded. <laughs> You're going to have to push out your meme on this story during the show. What? No. Memes. What's a meme? Oh, come on. One of these original. This is a great meme no. from back in the day. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You're going to have to share it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I guess that about does this for today, really. Dunna na, dunna na. Veritasium. It's not an investment. Dunna na. There you go, folks. All right, so final thought time for me, real quick, just to let you guys know Hoddle Hoddle is starting a liquidity week. So uh, this is from their publication or their blog post about it we invite everyone to participate and share this information about the initiative of hodlehodl.com which will happen between the 14th and 21st of august liquidity week will is basically an initiative to fulfill their entire order book by inside incentivizing traders to participate and reducing their exchange fees to 0.3 percent for every trade so yeah, I thought I would call attention to it to see if we can, you know, bring some liquidity to these decentralized exchanges. And just one more quick final note. Uh, tomorrow, talking about all this going back, tomorrow marks the two-year mark since the first episode of the Digest. So congrats, guys. I don't know if you remember how crazy that was, but this time two years ago, we were in the midst of Bcash's stupid difficulty adjustments and segwit 2x narratives streaming at us and yeah we just jumped right into this whole thing and we're here we are two years later so it's pretty awesome so those are the final thoughts for me today yeah one i mean one thing i want to point out is you know considering the three of us besides nopara um, are either residents or citizens of the U.S., I think it's important to say that we are definitely not breaking HODL HODL's terms of service by <laughs> by using their exchange because we're technically not allowed to. Um, <laughs> They're very peer-to-peer -peer exchange that excludes the United States. Speak for yourself. Shinobi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just but, um, want to share this. I just wanted to share this, that one of the nights I had an opportunity of drink with one of the founder of uh, the Hada Hada and 
uh, I'm not sure which one or what's his name, <laughs> but but he's 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 really an interesting character, and and it it seems to me he, he really wants the best for Bitcoin, also wants to make money, but uh, uh, it was it was so like for six hours whatever was the topic he he kept coming back but with other other we are doing this and we are doing this and no matter we are talking about girls or or socks or whatever he kept coming back to Hada Hada he just couldn't stop he is so obsessed so anyway <laughs> I, I, I definitely think <laughs> these these people are, are up to up to good things and they are kind of in a gray area but uh, I think they are finding a sweet spot there not completely decentralized but not that uh, centralized either yeah those guys are definitely doing some uh, work over there and like you're saying it's good to know that the guys that you're talking about working with are passionate about it and it's, yeah and they're doing some things. So, yeah, if you're uh, not in the United States, maybe you want to help fulfill some order books, this is the week to do it. And, <laughs> and uh, my no, final I'm sorry, thought. I said the word done. That's done. That's it. No, 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 I have to say this. Can't don't say it. Okay, so my my this is more of a wish list item that I just want. I don't know if there are any artists or me expert memers listening, but I want to see a badge or a sticker mm -hmm. that is a remake of the Operation Enduring Clusterfuck badge. That is, it's actually clusterfuck is a military term, surprisingly, and um, yeah. So no part. I don't know if you remember. You probably do, but I think you wrote an article last year or 2017 where you said you, you brought up the notion of a clusterfuck wallet, which is a wallet that fucks up clustering algorithms of blockchain analysis companies. And so I want to see a clusterfuck badge that is Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin based. So yes, that is my wish list item. Yes, I, I remember. That's uh, that's still an interesting idea. I don't think anyone, we, I know no one explored it. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna take us out on a serious, serious, serious fucking note. Okay. All right. All right. Something happened over the weekend. All right, and I just it, it has to be said before before we end. We know what you did, you dirty fucking whore. And on that note, we will see you guys next week.